Hi there and welcome to this lecture about the French Revolution. My name is Marcus Henriksen and I'm a history teacher here in Sweden. Well, if we are to look at the French Revolution, we must first look at how the French society worked during the 18th century. It was one of Europe's most populous countries, about 25 million people lived there, and they were a great power in many ways. Most people in the courts around Europe were therefore taught to speak French, and France was seen by many as the model when it came to things like culture and beauty. So if stuff became popular at the French court, it spread to basically all the courts in Europe. Stuff like wigs, for example. But there are many contributing factors behind the French Revolution. Even today, historians argue about which factors and reasons that were behind the start of the French Revolution. Some place the greatest importance on materialistic factors, such as the lack of food or high taxes, while other historians place the greatest importance on idealistical things, such as democracy, the equal value of all, and so on. So let's begin with the philosophers, like Montesquieu, Voltaire, Jean Locke, Rousseau, and many others. They had a big impact on people's way of reasoning and thinking. Because they promoted stuff like democracy, they questioned the rule of the king, they also wanted to separate the church from the state, they promoted equality, brotherhood, and so on. But yeah, there were female philosophers as well, for example, Mary Wollstonecraft. The philosophers became so important because mostly of the art of printing that had developed considerably since the 16th century here in Europe. It was now much easier and cheaper to print books and writings. In addition, more people than ever before could now read, especially among the middle class, and many of the books that people read during this time came from the Enlightenment philosophies. Another contributing factor are the higher unemployment rate in France during this time. Many people had become unemployed due to the fact of the spinning Jenny machine in Great Britain during this time. And that forced people to beg, steal, or starve. Another contributing factor are the huge financial differences between the rich and the poor in France. The wealthy nobility were free from paying taxes, which gave them a great financial advantage that annoyed many people farmers and the middle class in the cities. So, yeah, it contributed. In order to get the country's finances in order, the French king also chose to sell titles ranging from judges in the court system to ministerial positions to the highest bidder, which also, in fact, increased the power and influence of the nobility even further. The king also sold some of the lands he owned again to the nobility, 
which meant that the nobility could limit the right of ordinary people in France to hunt and fish, which of course irritated many and contributed to the general dissatisfaction in France. The king had total power, or it is also known as absolute monarchy. The French king Louis XVI did basically what he wanted when he wanted. This also contributed to the starting of the French Revolution. And also, of course, the higher taxes. The king introduced increasingly higher taxes, partly to pay for all the king's various wars, including the ones that was now raging in the United States, but also the Seven Years' Wars, and, of course, to pay for his own luxurious lifestyle with a bunch of parties, gardens, balls, castles, and so on. Here is some pictures from the Palace of Versailles outside of Paris. The Queen was no better, Marie Antoinette. She bought expensive dresses all the time, very expensive makeup, perfumes daily, jewels, and so on. She might have also been unfaithful with the Swedish military man Axel von Fersen. The irony of it all is that when the French king, in his attempt to reduce the influence of the British, sent help to America so that they would gain their independence, it would also contribute to his own death and to the start of democracy in France. First, the United States would gain their independence, but then we can see the French Revolution start. And yeah, the starvation in 1788 also contributed to the start of the French Revolution. The king tried to solve this situation with higher taxes. This was a very big mistake. So this starts what is known by many historians as the legal revolution. In France they had what is known as a constituent uh, ensemble. Basically every group in France had one vote. The middle class, or the people from the cities, had one vote, the clergy had one vote, the nobility had one vote, and the farmers had one vote. But since the clergy and nobility cooperated basically every time with one another, because they both had tax-free, they had some privileges that the other two classes didn't have, the citizens couldn't do much, because the king had some kind of veto right, so if it got to 2-2 two, two in the voting, the king and queen, they could choose which side uh, who should win. And since the king always sided with the clergy and the nobility, that meant that 97-98% to 98 of the population in France didn't or couldn't do anything. So they wanted to create a more popular government. They wanted more democracy. So when they started their own national assembly, the king banned it and closed their meeting rooms. But they then settled in a ball house with the goal of changing France constitution. So the national assembly in France would gain more and more power. More and more people chose to leave from the previous government, from the nobility and the clergy, because they knew that this new National Assembly would, in the end, be the new government.
and this would in fact make the king quite powerless because he had no choice but to give the power to the National Assembly. On the 27th of June the king was forced to accept what had happened and the remaining representatives of the first and second estate they now had to join the new formed National Assembly. Louis XVI now felt threatened, he therefore gathered his soldiers, including a lot of foreign ones, and dismissed the very popular finance minister in France, Necker. It also circulated rumors in Paris that the king intended to kill everybody. We don't really know for sure if he had those plans or not, but this would in fact create the spark that would ignite the French Revolution. So the Bastille in Paris was stormed, the people wanted guns and weapons and they had huge depots of that in this prison. And they did so on July the 14th, which today is French national holiday or national day. The king power now was divided, he had to share it with the people. On August the 4th a new tax system was introduced in France and it would also be the end of the nobility's tax freedom. On the 22nd of August the Declaration on Human and Civil Rights was introduced, one of the most important ones uh, from freedom of speech was the right for every man in France to vote. And they are also the base for the modern human rights that we can see today. Gilbert de Motier, Marquis of Lafayette, led the new French National Guard. And he was one of the main advocates of New France. He also wrote a declaration of independence similar to the one previously obtained in the United States, but for France this time. However, many people in Paris still saw the king as a major threat, especially after some journalists started writing about the king and the queen's parties, where they made it clear that they hated the revolution and the people. On October the 5th, 1789, hundreds of women marched to Versailles with Lafayette, partly to get bread but also to get the king to sign the new French Declaration of Independence and to sign the new tax system. To appease the crowd, the royal couple now had to move back to Paris. In June 1791, Louis and Marie Antoinette tried to escape the country and come back with a large army to crush the revolution, but their attempt was stopped. They were helped by the Swede Axel von Fersen, but they were arrested and taken back to Paris. Atheism during this time in France became more popular. Many people choose to leave the Christian church, they burned down many churches or converted them into orphanages. The king's last attempt to remain in power happened in the year 1792. He started a war against Austria and Prussia in hope that the new France would fail and that he would regain his power, but it backlashed and he didn't. In 1792, the king now lost his power completely. He was once again put in custody and in 1793, the National Convention was completed where it was explained how France would be governed in the future, which is now how France is governed today. The new government decided that the king was the enemy of the country and should be executed and on January 21, 1793 he was executed by the guillotine. In many European countries where kings and queens still ruled, they saw this new French uh, democratic system as a large threat. 
Sweden and the Swedish king wanted to overthrow the new more democratic France alongside Austria, Great Britain, Prussia and Russia. So in order to have some kind of major defense against this new threat, they decided to introduce the so-called compulsory military service which occurred on August the 23rd 1793 and by that France gained a huge army. But the result was still chaos. They lost many battles, they lost many wars and this seriously destabilized the order in France and there was now a greater risk for a new civil war. To stop this, Maximilien de Robespierre took power and he decided to eliminate all his enemies and dissidents and uh, if he just heard as much as a rumor, he would basically kill you. This started what is known as the Reign of Terror in France. Thousands of people died just in Paris between 1,660 and 10,000 people were executed by the guillotine but in the end people had enough, they decided to kill Robespierre and his followers and they were put under the guillotine in July 1794. This is also known as the Thermidor crisis. The men who overthrew Robespierre gained power in France. They formed a new government called the Directorate. And yeah, they could stabilize the situation. However, the head of them, Paul de Bura, was extremely corrupt. But yeah, it was still better than under Robespierre's rule. France would then be governed by five directors and the National Assembly, which they divided into two chambers, the Council of 500 and the Council of the Elders. This would then form the basis of the French democracy that exists today. So how did the French Revolution end? Well, personally, I believe that this, it is now over with the end of Maximilien Robespierre. I mean, democracy had been restored. However, some historians disagree. They want to continue the French Revolution until Napoleon Bonaparte's coup d'etat in 1799 and some even further until 1804 when he was crowned emperor and some only at the end when France would become a monarchy again after Napoleon Bonaparte. So yeah, people disagree. Here are three really important words in order to understand the French Revolution. Freedom, equality and brotherhood. And they represent the three colors in the French flag. And the French Revolution had a major impact on the world. We can now see the start of the modern democracies. A series of European monarchies now began to be replaced by republics and democracies. For example, the Russian Revolution in 1905. But yeah, you can see the same struggles in countries such as Spain, Great Britain, Sweden and others. The feudal privileges were abolished in many countries, the nobility was no longer exempt from taxation and total warfare was invented with the general conscription. The sources I have used for this lecture and video are A History of World Societies by John P. McKay, World History New Perspective by Clyde Ponting, Perspective on History by Lars Hans and Norian Nyström, History by Elisabeth Ivansson, Robert Sandberg and Matthias Tudai, uh, Histories uh, Foremost uh, Fugitives by Gunnar Wall, History of France Documentary, Maximilien Robespierre, The Reign of Terror, Literature, Voltaire, Marie Antoinette Biography, Her Own Undoing, French Revolution Episode 1, French Revolution Episode 2.
But if you have any questions at all, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Otherwise, I wish you a great day. Bye.